All right, we're going to start now. I'm uh, Eric Brewer, VP of Infrastructure at Google, and uh, I can say I've been involved in Kubernetes longer than you, and I don't mean that in a mean way. I just feel really lucky. <laughs> Uh, some of the things I'll talk about today are some of the things we talked about in Kubernetes in 2014 as aspirational goals. Um, so why did users choose Kubernetes? There's a lot of reasons. I think the, we'll start with the easy ones. They like open source and they like the community, love the community. If you didn't notice, there's a lot of community here this week. It's kind of amazing. This is my third, I guess my third KubeCon, maybe more. I don't know how many there actually have been. Then there's the you know, frequent releases and resource efficiency. That's actually what got Google to use containers 10 years ago, was really how many apps can we pack in a fixed number of machines, and containers make that much easier. Uh, runs anywhere. In this case, I mean different clouds and on-prem. That was obviously not an original goal for Google uh, in terms of internal use, but certainly for external use, it's important that we meet customers where they are, which we'll talk about quite a bit today. And of course, what developers like most is the fast deployments. Now, in 2014, we had somewhat similar reasons about why to do Kubernetes at all. And the short answer is we felt like we were building applications internally using containers and fast deployments and services, and the rest of the world wasn't really doing it the way we thought they could. And we felt like, here's Here's a platform, maybe we can change what cloud means. And I think we're actually in the middle, collectively, of changing what cloud means. Enterprises have a few things they like about this too, all the same things, but really it's, it's this apply. Right? That's gotta be the favorite command of Kubernetes, apply. Right? You, you do your stuff, you hit apply, magic stuff happens, and you have a new version. Right? And when enterprises think about what they want uh, both for themselves and in their move to the cloud, what they want is really velocity. They want to feel like they have a good developer experience that is effective and, and frankly, fun. Right? I think apply is a fun command. Uh, it's, like a little, it's like the little dopamine hit from, from programming. The reality, of course, is you have Kubernetes as only part of your inter infrastructure. Right? You know, in some sense, I would say, your enterprise is lucky if they have Kubernetes as part of the infrastructure today. Uh, they almost certainly have some virtualized workloads, and they may even have some, some traditional, older, like very old, even mainframe workloads as well. And we kind of have to mix these things together, and that is not easy. We did a bunch of investigations into enterprises. What kinds of use cases do they see for trying to mix uh, cloud and on-prem? And this includes multi-cloud as well. I won't cover all these, and we're going to demo some of them, actually. But you know, an easy one, the most common one I see is I, I want to do my mobile app. I can build that in the cloud, but it still needs to connect back to my actual giant database on-prem, and that's not going to move to the cloud anytime soon. So I have to have a hybrid solution for that. Uh, another one that's interesting is I want to run a little Kubernetes cluster on all of my big box stores or all of my oil rigs. Right? And so I, that's not going to be in the cloud. <laughs> I'm not going to put my oil rig in the cloud. It doesn't work. Right? So I need some local development environment that's consistent across all these different sites and that I can manage as a, as a whole group. There's you know, lots of jurisdictional reasons. I need to keep this data in Germany or this data in Europe. I need to track all user data and keep that in country. Right? That ends up meaning that you have either cloud restrictions or mo more commonly I have this data center that manages these particular sets of uh, assets and they have to stay there. So we need some non-cloud solution for those things. So there's a lot of other things. The ones we'll talk about today really uh, and give some demos of are local execution and hybrid services. And then you say, well, what do you really care about as this enterprise, you know, CIO is kind of top level view down. And I think the ones that ring true for me are this first one, move to the cloud at our own pace, meaning Moving to cloud is not something we can do in a week, right? It's going to be five years, maybe 10 years, right? So what does that mean? That means I have a long period where I have to run in both places, and it also means I can't not modernize on-prem, right? So the strategy here is give you the choice. You can modernize on-prem, you can move to the cloud, you can do any mix of those two actions on a fine-grained basis, kind of app by app in your enterprise. Right, that's the freedom they actually want, right? which is let us move the things we can to the cloud as we can, let us modernize the things that we can't. So Kubernetes in this context is about modernizing things on-prem, 
because it's not ready time for those things to move to the cloud yet. When you want to move, operate in this way, you have to have a pretty consistent environment, meaning that if I want to deploy an app in different clouds or on-prem, the, the environment in which I deploy those apps has to be very consistent. Otherwise, I have to write multiple versions. Right? So what we want to do is kind of take all the things that vary by the environment and pull them out of the source code. I'm going to call that externalize them. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And then on top of that, it's not enough to run the app. I need all the supporting infrastructure of security and auditing and how do I know where the keys are, how do I manage the keys, and I like all that stuff to be consistent across the environments also. Like how do I have a policy that says here's user access control to this data and that access control has to be implemented consistently on different clouds and on-prem. Right? That's a good goal, not easy to do. So I, the strategy we have to make hybrid work is really has these two parts. First, realize that the easiest way to get consistency is to run the same code. Right? Then it's consistent. It's not just consistent at the API level, it's actually consistent at the semantic level because the code determines the semantics. Right? If it's just the API level, you don't know for sure that semantics actually match. Right? And guess what? They won't always match. Right? So core to this strategy is let's use a bunch of open source. <laughs> right? Open source will give us the same code in different environments and we will get consistently because of that. Consistency because of that. So this shows up as Kubernetes, but also shows up as Istio and TensorFlow and Open Service Broker. And we'll talk about a couple of those today. And the second core idea to this strategy is that it's got to be based on services. The, a service is the unit of placement of functionality. If you break your app into many services, you decide on a per service basis where it runs, and some services will run on multiple environments, and that's okay, right? The ones you need everywhere, say like DNS, right? That's going to run in every environment, right? Other services like managing your European user assets may only run in one data center because that's the only place it's needed. But the way you're thinking about it is is creating and consuming services that span environments. And we'll show you how to do that with Open Service Broker today. Now, I won't talk as much about Istio, but Istio is, is a big part of this, and what it's gonna, I'll show what it does on a future slide, but really it gives us the control later we need operationally. So back to externalization. The key here is that all the things that need to vary across the environment can't be in the source code, right? So we have to externalize them. What does that mean? Well, it means you put them somewhere else. So it turns out containers already do this, right? They actually, in the container, tell you which libraries you need, right? And you don't have to worry about how libraries get onto an operating system or onto a machine, right? The package management part goes away. And that is something that will vary by environment. Services, obviously, we're gonna externalize all the telemetry, all of the, uh, Access, user access control, right? If you're writing source code that has, you know, check user ID in the source code, you're doing it wrong, right? That's, that will vary by environment, and therefore you can't have it there. And likewise, events down, down the bottom, events are, are a glue, but they're a glue that is external to the systems that they're gluing together, which means it's easy to glue different services across different environments using events as the mechanism to, to glue them together. So all three of these big open pieces actually give us some of this externalization. Uh, Kubernetes, I, I hope you know, but really it's, it's decoupling development and deployment. We can do all of our development stuff first, deploy in different environments. We, that deployment is consistent. We'll show that today. Istio is really a, it's the Envoy routing mesh that goes under all services. And because it's a a mesh of proxies is essentially interposing, interposing on all traffic, which means that we can do access control, we can do security, we can do uh, authentication of services to each other, we can do telemetry. So, for example, if you want to know the SLO, or sorry, the latency distribution of a service, we can collect that at the proxy. It does not, again, it does not go in your source code, it's externalized and therefore consistent across all environments. And finally, Open Service Broker is really decoupling service providers from service consumption. So if you know you need DNS, you don't actually do anything in your source code to get that. We're going to actually cause you to look up a service, find it in the catalog, and use that version. And that version will be customized for your environment in a way that you don't need to know about at the time you write your service. So 
all these together, basically, we're trying to get a level of traction that hides the environmental differences. You know, decouple development and deployment, decouple traffic management, operational things, setting a policy, that's what you get from Istio, and then decouple services producers from consumers. And we'll show this open service broker today where we produce a service that's found in the service broker and then actually gets consumed and we'll show that on different environments. Where do we get when we're all done with this? Well, you get a open multi-cloud way to deploy applications, but not just deploy, actually monitor them as well, right? So all the things you get, you want to know about your service, including uh, how they're running, latency for all the things, all that you just get to collect in a uniform way. So with that, we're going to move to the, the fun part of this talk with Aparna and Matt giving some demos. Thank you, Eric. That was amazing. All right, so Matt and I are going to do demos. By the way, there are some seats up front. If folks want to move in a little bit, uh, you know, we can make room at the edges. That would be great. So um, thank you, Eric. Um, there are a set of hybrid abstractions that are under development. Um, and Matt and I and many of the Google engineers here are involved in them. And so we're going to try and demo two of them here today. Uh, if you're a developer that's developing an application that you want to deploy on-premise and in the cloud, you might want a systematic way of doing that. I mean, you could go sort of cloud by cloud and deploy it. But we're working on something called a multi-cluster registry, which is um, actually Christian Bell here is leading that work, um, which is a component in the Kubernetes open source project that makes it more systematic to deploy your applications across clouds. You know, the other thing that often happens is when you're developing an application, you actually have dependencies. Uh, and you might want to consume other services that you aren't writing, uh, you know, either first party from other developers or third party services. And that can be a challenge. You might have to go and learn the semantics of each service that you want to use. But there's a standard that is emerging for this, and that's called the Open Service Broker API. And so we're going to demo that and its use uh, in hybrid cloud, because it's emerging as a standard across different clouds. And Martin Ganholm, who's at the back of the room, uh, has been working on that um, in, in Google. The other building blocks that uh, I'm calling hybrid primitives are Istio and the Kubernetes Cluster API. We're not going to go demo those today just because of lack of time. But these are more for operators. If you are managing a large hybrid environment, you want to manage the services and make sure that they're authenticated and credentialed, Istio is a really gr great tool for that, as well as visualizing those services. And then lastly, the Kubernetes Cluster API allows operators to deploy and upgrade clusters uh, in a consistent way across clouds. So let's get started. Um, so Matt and I have decided that we're going to go into business, in a startup. It's going to be a bookstore. And it's going to be a really awesome bookstore. It's going to have fiction, nonfiction, all kinds of books. And you're actually going to be our customers. You're going to buy these books. Uh, we've decided that we want a, a major online presence. So we're going to have uh, you know, a books online in a website uh, hosted in the cloud. But we've also struck a deal with a number of different stores, hundreds of stores, where we're going to set up kiosks. And the kiosks are going to be running the same application that's running in the cloud. And you can go there and you can purchase your books in the store. So that's the business we're going into. And of course, these two applications that are running on-premise and in the cloud need to have a shared inventory so we know who's buying what and how much more we need. So they're going to write back to a shared inventory. And that's what, that's what we're, we're going to show you, the hybrid bookstore. Of course, given our heritage, we've decided that the online app is going to be Google Cloud. Uh, and we do have some stickers for you for Google Cloud later on if you <laughs> want to come get those. And we're going to use Google Kubernetes Engine for this. So that's where we're going to put uh, the bookstore front end online. In terms of the kiosks, um, so we've had a donation from Cisco. They've given us um, a set of UCS servers on which they've installed um, VMware and open source Kubernetes. And that's going to be our consistent environment. We're going we're to run the kiosk app on those clusters. So let's get started and show you. Here we are. Um, we're in Google Cloud. And this is Kubernetes Engine. So we can just go ahead and create a cluster. Um, and you can see me type with one hand and hold the mic. <laughs> so we're going to create uh, uh, our Cloud Central cluster. Uh, and the Cloud Central cluster, you know, I don't want it to be a zonal cluster, because I never want this bookstore to go down. So I'm actually going to choose a regional cluster. This is a beta feature. just went beta on Monday of this week. 
Uh, Wes Hutchins, if he's here, he worked on this. But uh, essentially, it takes the control plane of Kubernetes and spreads it across three zones by default. But not just that, it also spreads your nodes. So my application will be spread across three zones. So that, you know, should there be an outage in one zone, my books are still going to survive. Uh, and I'm going to choose the latest version of Kubernetes because that's going to have the maximum patches and it's going to be the most secure. Uh, I'm a startup owner, so I'm going to go with two nodes per zone for a total of six uh, nodes in this cluster. And that's it, and I can go ahead and create it. That's going to take a couple of minutes. So we have a pre-warmed cluster here in US Central 1 called Cloud Central. As you can see, it has six nodes, uh, and that's distributed across three, these three zones. So Central 1A, Central 1B, and 1F, two nodes each. And I'm actually going to um, log into this cluster uh, from this VM, this test VM. And I've also um, got the credentials for the on-premise cluster, the kiosk uh, that's running VMware and Kubernetes. So let me go ahead and show you those two clusters here. All right, so we've got credentials. Here's Cloud Central that's running in GKE. And here's the on-prem cluster, that's the, uh, that's the kiosk. And let me go ahead and get nodes uh, in a nice format for you for the, for the Cloud Central. And it's what we saw before. It's got six nodes, two in each zone. Uh, and then let's also connect to the uh, on-prem cluster and see how, how that's looking and what does that have. So this one is a simple non-HA cluster. It's got three nodes and one master. Uh, and it's running a different version of Kubernetes, 1.7, and a different operating system. And one of the things you're going to see is that it's not going to matter. Um, actually, the bookstore app is going to run on both of these clusters. And the service catalog is going to run on both of these clusters. And they're going to connect just fine. So um, now I could go ahead and uh, deploy the bookstore app on the cloud cluster and then separately on the kiosk. But I have hundreds of stores that these kiosks are going to run in. So I'd have to do it individually. And Matt DeLeo, who's my CTO, has been participating in the multi-cluster SIG. And he told me that there's this thing called the multi-cluster registry. And he's created an image of it in GCR. And he told me to deploy that. So I'm going to go ahead and deploy that. Um, and this is how I deploy it. I basically run CR init. Uh, cluster registry and install it in this namespace from GCR. And Matt's going to tell us why that's a better way of doing uh, our hybrid application. Sure. Thanks, Aparna. So one thing we realized after talking to, to uh, users of Kubernetes is that they're already running multiple clusters, often uh, even dozens, uh, for the reasons we kind of enumerated earlier. Uh, they really need a way to keep track of them all. They need a way to um, perform operations on, the, on a subset of them, or maybe on all of them. And um, they're, right now, what they're doing is a lot of them are using hard-coded lists, maybe checked into Git, or maybe files on network resources that they kind of share between, between operators and CD tools. Um, and what the cluster registry is, it allows users to kind of have a centralized store of their clusters. They can define labels that they can then use to filter and enumerate um, the clusters that they want to perform these operations on. And in, in terms of the SIG, you know, it's, it's kind of forming the basis of a lot of the tools we're going to be building around uh, multi-cluster. All right. So I think the registry is almost up. So it's deploying as a separate API server in one of the nodes in Cloud Central. And uh, we've prepared uh, each of the clusters as a uh, uh, YAML file. So let us show you the first cluster. This is Cloud Central. Yes, yeah, so we've applied a few labels to this uh, Cloud Central cluster. We've got the app bookstore, so it's going to indicate that we're going to deploy our bookstore app there. Um, we've set the provider type to cloud, and we have a zone for it. Uh, since we said it was going to be HA, we, we had went ahead and marked it as HA, so we can kind of, you know, again, keep track of all the things we care about with the cluster. And the same thing for the on-prem cluster. Yeah, and so this one's very similar as well. Uh, we've got the app bookstore. Um, this time, the provider type's on-prem. We have a different zone. Our, our store is on the East Coast. And again, it wasn't HA, so we just marked it as false. So by attaching this metadata to these clusters, um, when we go ahead, uh, we're going to switch context to cluster registry and then apply these YAML files to register these clusters, as well as a set of fake clusters to model the hundreds of stores that you know, we're going to have kiosks in. We're going to register all of those now with the cluster registry. So now we've got a central database that has all of our clusters. And let's see, get clusters. So now we're running this against the cluster registry API. And we see that we've got Cloud Central, we've got on-prem, we've got a number of other clusters. What do we want to do next? Matt? Yeah, so let's go ahead and filter our list down and figure out where we want to deploy our 
bookstore app. So this gives us uh, the, the two clusters. Uh, there's a little bit of an obscuration, but it says Cloud Central, and then uh, on-prem is the second one. Um, and uh, <laughs> thanks. Sorry about that. Um, and then, so let's go ahead and whittle it down a little bit more. Let's deploy to our cloud one. OK. We're going to go in business first online. Yeah, so uh, very simple. We just add the new provider type to cloud to our filtered um, list, and then we get out Cloud Central. OK, so we're going to switch contest to the cluster registry, uh, to Cloud Central, and then start to deploy our bookstore app. And so let's take a look at our bookstore app. It's got the usual services that you would expect. It's got a, fr uh, a front end deployment and service. It's got an inventory service and deployment, user service, and purchase service. So um, that's looking good. I think we can go ahead and um, create a namespace for it and then apply. And this is the power command, right? It's kubectl apply and everything in that registry. And pretty much, we should have an online bookstore. So let's see. Let's get pods. Well, it looks like the user service is up, the purchases service is up, the inventory service is up. But the bookstore front end didn't deploy. And we could wait for it to deploy, but um, it's actually not going to deploy. Uh, and that's because we want to show you uh, the, a feature here. Uh, the bookstore app actually has a dependency that doesn't exist yet. And so it's not going to deploy until that dependency is met. So let's go into the deployment. Uh, if I can, yeah, there we go. I'm going to cat the deployment so that, so that um, we can look at what this deployment looks like and why the bookstore front end didn't deploy. So it looks like uh, we have a couple of volumes here. So one of them is the secret name GCP IAM credentials. I don't think we created that, right? You're right. We didn't actually create any IAM credentials. And OK, so that sounds good, like a but, dependency. But here's another one. We've got this pub sub topic at the very end. And I don't think we created that secret either. That's right. We talked about the front end um, and in both of the locations, you know, uh, publishing what's happening with the inventory. And we were going to use pub sub for that. So um, we are going to need the pub sub service as well as the IAM credentials. These are dependencies, right? These are third party services that you might want to use in your application. So what we could do now is we could go to uh, Cloud Platform, and we could set up a pub subtopic, and we'd have to learn the semantics of that. Um, or we can, and, and then we'd also have to get uh, an IAM service account and, so that we could get credentials. So we could do all of that. Or there is a simpler mechanism. Um, I think we, um, Eric talked about um, you know, the Open Service Broker API. This API provides a standard way to instantiate and consume any service. And GCP, Google Cloud, and other clouds um, can create, and, and any, any provider, frankly, can create brokers into which they publish these services so that users like Matt and I, who are trying to start a bookstore, can go and discover these services and connect to them without having to worry about the specific semantics of each service. Uh, and so the GCP service broker is actually live. It's in early access. If you want to get early access, you can sign up at this uh, URL. Uh, but in order for us to access that broker, we're going to have to set up a service catalog. So, um, and that's kind of a nice segue because it allows you to show us one of the coolest extensibility features of Kubernetes. So we're going to go ahead and instead of um, uh, instead of manually provisioning PubSub and then getting the IAM credentials from Google, we're actually going to use the service catalog. To deploy the service catalog, I need to be a super user in the cluster. So I am going ahead and giving APC, now that's me, um, admin rights to the cluster. Uh, and then I can run this powerful command, sc install. And that is going to install a service catalog, which will then give me access to the full service broker that GCP publishes. So now let's see if that's installed. It usually takes a little bit. So it's not done yet. So the controller manager and the API server is still coming up. Um, and what is the service catalog, really? So um, this is quite, um, uh, it's quite a powerful mechanism. It's using Cube Aggregator, which is a way to add and extend the Kubernetes API natively. And so what's happening is that the service catalog is deploying as a separate API server uh, with its own controller manager and its own etcd uh, backup store. It's deploying in one of the nodes in the Cloud Central cluster. But the more important thing is it's also registering with the master um, of the cluster. And so it'll become an extension to the normal Kubernetes API. And I'll be able to access the service catalog features just like I do uh, you know, anything else in Kubernetes. And that's really the kube aggregator extensibility functionality. So let's see. What have we got now? 
It looks like we have our API server, our etc CD operator, and our side cover. We're missing the controller manager. Yeah. OK, yeah. so we're going to wait just a little bit more. And uh, when the control, OK, there we go. So now the full service catalog is set up. And we're going to go ahead and use this powerful command to add the GCP service broker. And by the way, you can subscribe to any service broker that exists. Um, so let me now show you this actually in the UI. Um, so if I go to Kubernetes engine, there's this thing called service instances. And I can go to service instances. You have to be part of the EAP program. Uh, and then I can click on browse service catalog. And, and here I should see all of the services that the GCP service broker publishes. And this list is going to get longer over time. But here you can see that um, Google is providing all of these services through the open service broker API. Um, so that's great. I mean, PubSub, Cloud SQL, uh, GCS. I, of course, need IAM, and I need PubSub. So I can go ahead and create PubSub right from there, and then uh, create that in, an instance of that service for myself, um, and, then, and then subscribe to it, basically bind, uh, bind to it. But I'm actually going to do that here. So let's see. You see the same set of services here in the command line. And now I'm going to go ahead and create an instance of the GCP I am service in the bookstore namespace, so that's been created. And then similarly, an instance of the PubSub service, and that's been created. Uh, and actually, this is going to run a little bit in the background. Um, so I am instance has been provisioned. And let's wait for the PubSub instance to provision. And what it's doing behind the scenes is right now, when the I am instance is being provi provisioned, it's creating a service account for our, um, our uh, namespace. And it's also creating a pub sub topic for our namespace. And uh, when we bind to it, I can discuss that a little bit more. Hopefully, uh, it won't take too much longer. There we go. There go. Yeah. Um, so now when we're binding, we're actually going to take the service account and inject the credentials into our Kubernetes cluster as a secret. Um, this takes uh, sometimes a little bit longer than the um, provisioning, uh, at least during the demo. Um, but uh, once it's done, we'll have the secret sitting there, and we can consume it from our application. But remember, we need two. We need the IAM uh, binding, so, and we also need the PubSub binding. And so I think it's almost ready. So the nice thing about this mechanism is that it's a common mechanism no matter what type of dependency and what type of service uh, you're using. And the injection of secrets and you know, then the provisioning of the uh, bookstore front end is, uh, kind of, is, a, is kind of a common methodology uh, in Kubernetes for how to handle dependencies. And, and we think a very elegant one. All right, the binding is being created. Yes, and okay. And we're good. All right. And then we have to do this also for the pub sub service, and then wait for that binding, and then we're almost there. After that, our bookstore, our online bookstore, should deploy automatically, and then we'll be able to see what books are available, and you'll be able to buy the books. Um, so that's just the online bookstore. Then we also have the on-premise kiosk bookstore, and we're doing exactly the same set of steps there. And Matt will show you that. He won't run you through everything, but he'll show you, um, he'll show you the bookstore coming up on, on premise. This is done, right? Yep. All right. Great. OK. Yeah, so now we have our two secrets that our service depended on. And uh, I bet if we look now, we should hopefully see some pods uh, that will come up. This might take a few seconds, because it's probably in a back off loop. Um, but in a few seconds, we should see the front end come up. And our service has already been provisioned. There's a load balancer for it. We'll show that in a minute. Um, and we should be uh, ready to go. Yeah. So the bookstore front end will come up. And then it'll be published as an external service. Um, and then I will get the IP address of that um, external service. And then we'll open a tab and start shopping. There, there we go. We go. All right, so get service, and the external IP address is 104.198.195.152. If you want, you can go to this external IP address, and you can shop online as well. So this is the bookstore. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Um, this is our online website, and you got a lot of different kinds of, you know, as I mentioned, fiction, nonfiction. You can go here and you can purchase. Um, and now I'm going to ask Matt to talk about the the on-premise bookstore. Sure. So just to show you uh, what we did, we don't have time during the demo to show it, but we did the exact same steps that we just showed you. Um, we ran through. We uh, we already had the service broker and um, service catalog installed. So all we did was you know, create an instance and bind to it. 
um, for GCP and IAM. It's, it's talking to the same project, and it creates a new topic that then we can then uh, uh, use for our inventory control. Um, so to, speaking of inventory control, let's set up the two topics. We have a, a pub sub reader. This is going to run. Uh, I, this particular one was going to run in our cloud environment because that's the most uh, makes the most sense. And what it's going to do is it's going to listen to the topics, and the topics are being again published by both bookstores, and it's going to give us a um, a kind of a real time view of the um, of the uh, purchases coming through. Right. So uh, both bookstores, as you purchase books, and it does look like someone has bought books, right? Like so. Yeah. So three people have bought books in in the online store, oh, and wow. we yeah four five people. We're okay. Selling out. We're, we're selling out. <laughs> yeah. This is here the the on premise bookstore, and we should give them the 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 IP address for the on premise bookstore too, so they can go shopping on premise. Especially if a book is sold out online, you can buy it on premise because it is essentially we have the same inventory here. So it's thirty five dot two two seven dot two three two. Uh, dot 160. And uh, we're going to go back and, uh, yes, we've got quite a bit of shopping going on in store one, wow. um, but nobody is buying yet from store zero. So that's the kiosk. So I'm going to go ahead and, and what would you like to buy? Um, let's buy the crock pot one. The crock pot. Yeah, yeah, I need the crock pot. Yeah, yeah. Cooking. Um, I saw math is hard. Oh, wow. people math are, is hard. Yeah. Oh, people are, are starting this. This yeah. is good. We're going. Okay, we're doing well. And yes, Store Zero is starting to, starting to have great sales as well. This is excellent. So um, that's actually the conclusion of our demo. Thank you for shopping with us. Um, we hope that, uh, you know, that, that, <laughs> that it's, a, it's a very successful business. Um, uh, essentially, what we showed was a hybrid uh, retail operation that had uh, a bookstore online and a bookstore in kiosks. Um, they both published uh, their updates uh, through PubSub into a central inventory system, and we showed you the stream from that inventory system. Um, so um, uh, now we'll kind of come out of the role play. <laughs> the uh, use cases that we demonstrated here were the local execution and the hybrid services. So local execution being, you know, we're executing the same application um, on premise that we are uh, in, in the cloud. And you can also imagine doing CI CD. Should I want to update my bookstore, I can roll it out, um, you know, from the cloud to all my hundreds of kiosks as I go, as I go public. Um, and then we demonstrated the use of hybrid services as dependencies um, uh, through the open service broker work. Uh, so uh, there are a number of other use cases that these primitives also apply to. Uh, but those are the ones that we want, we were most excited about and wanted to show you today. Um, again, um, you know, these, we, we believe that these are, these are um, really helpful primitives for those who want to deploy applications across clouds uh, and, uh, and on-premise. And, on and I think, uh, I hope that you, you all have a chance to try this out. Okay, we're going to open it up to QA. One minute, One minute of Q&A. So a lot of these patterns could have been done in the VM world as well. What's different about containers that will make hybrid crowd successful, but wasn't that didn't happen in the VM world? Apply. <laughs> uh, ease of use, I would say. I mean, containers also help on other fronts. For example, we're running different OSs and different versions here, and the containers hide those differences pretty well, right? So we are, we have control of the software dependencies we need inside the pods. And then we're defining through the service catalog how to find and use, and find provision and use services and automate that. And it is true, we'll actually be having, you'll be able to create services on other things like Cloud Foundry, I was at Pivotal yesterday, or on VMs on prem. And you can add those to Open Service Broker. We do that with Apogee, for example. So you'll be able to mix services of all kinds, but I do feel like the leverage you get from Kubernetes and the velocity, that is actually for sure quite new. Absolutely. Yeah. Question was, can we run Open Service Broker on premises? And the answer is yes. It is also open source, and you use it. If you use it on prem, typically we have customers that want to use it to, to actually then put in Google services that they then connect to, right? Right. 
Yeah, um, so the legacy dependencies use case is often when you have a, a cloud native app that you're developing, say in GKE, and you want to connect to um, uh, dependencies that are on premise, maybe an ERP system. Um, uh, and, and, and really there, if you can put an API gateway in front of that application and create a RESTful API, um, then you can do any of these things, right? You can obviously connect to the cloud native application, but you can also use Istio to uh, to manage that the um, uh, to manage that service along with your other cloud native services. So that's essentially that that use case. All right, thank you very much.